you follow Bob, you never know where your papers are going to be. So, I have the honor of introducing the Grace Prep valedictorian for this year. And um, I, I know a valedictorian is about academics, but there is so much more to this person. Um, when I first, when he was a freshman, he was the manager on the soccer team. And he decided the next year to go out for the soccer team. And just to give you some sense of, I don't know that if he played soccer growing up or not, but by his junior year, he was the defensive player of the year. And he was tenacious on the, on the field. Um, he has a heart for those who have not heard God's word in other countries. He's been to China. He's been to Honduras. In the last year, he was in the jungles of Peru fighting off millions of mosquitoes. And in the last, in February, he went to Myanmar. And echoing the, the words of his father, you are deep water. And he just has a heart for those who haven't had the word, heard the word. And I want to introduce a solid individual, Mr. Caleb Pons. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'm told that valedictorian speeches look to the future. They inspire the class to succeed and to take life by the horns and become great. But I decided that 10 years from now, my five minute speech is not going to be the thing that gave these seniors the extra push to succeed. So Grace Prep class of 2012, instead of telling you to shoot for the stars or follow your dreams or spread your wings and fly, and instead of inspiring you with my cliche phrases, I'm going to tell you to find the things that do inspire you and to run with them. And that's the greatest word I can give you today. In light of that, what I'd like to share today is not as much to inspire you as it is to let you know what's inspired me. One inspiration that I've latched onto uh, in high school, one truth that I've come to understand is that it really doesn't matter what you do or what your personality is like. It doesn't matter what your vices and virtues are or exactly what direction your path takes you. Because in the words of C.S. Lewis, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. You have a body. So the things that you do in the physical, mental, emotional, those are the things that you have, not the things that you are. So whether you're a doctor or a garbage man, a politician or a puppeteer, a journalist or a musician, a dancer or a nurse. What's important is not what you're doing, but what you are being. For 16 years, I did a lot of doing. I was driven, I was motivated, I was gonna conquer the world, I was gonna spread my wings, shoot for the stars and follow my dreams. But in this last year, I've learned a lot about being. And through tireless prayers, unforgettable experiences, and irreplaceable relationships, I have come to a basic conclusion about being. And it won't be everyone's conclusion. I think of it as a kind of Kayla Pond's life motto. But in six short words, I want to be humble, be faithful, be love. Being humble is something that I've always longed for, but has never come naturally. I will be as honest with you now as I possibly could be. Being humble is not easy when success is abundant. I absolutely sympathize for people whose hearts are prideful because you might think that a stuck up person is just stuck up, but even behind those haughty eyes, it's just another searching being soul. And humble is a tough thing to be. So in the name of humility, I want to defend prideful people everywhere. <laughs> because the most arrogant, pompous, unhumble person there is, his heart is struggling as much as the next guy. And I say this because I love humility. I love it because it is 
such a complete expression of the spirit of Christ. And even that most prideful person can attain it by simply being in Christ. I'll tell you now that I could never be humble without Christ's spirit in me. So the non-act of being in Christ so that I can be humble is the most uplifting thought I can have. The second part of my Caleb Hahn's life motto is to be faithful. Faithfulness is the ability to forgive a person and always be dependable to them. My very favorite book in the whole world is The Giving Tree. In it, Shel Silverstein tells the story of a boy and a tree. It's short but meaningful. The boy and the tree love each other, but in time the boy grows distant. He only comes to the tree when he is dissatisfied with his life, when he wants something. But the tree is always willing to offer something of herself to make the boy happy. And she's completely selfish, selfless and unwilling to turn him away. The tree was so faithful to the boy, never turning him away, but always forgiving him from his selfishness and welcoming him time and again. The boy loved the tree, but he wasn't faithful to her. It was the tree's loving faithfulness that makes this story so meaningful to me. In my life, I've experienced faithfulness in many ways, but I think the thing that gave me the greatest appreciation for being faithful was my own shortcomings in the area. In the face of my own unfaithfulness, the unwillingness of some people in my life to abandon their faithfulness to me defies all that we're taught. Justice permits that unfaithfulness deserves to be answered with unfaithfulness, but a true state of being faithful never backs down. And it is that being, that unconditional faithfulness that makes relationships true. I don't want to show faithfulness and I don't want to do faithful things. I want to be faithful. And the third and final part of my conclusion about being is that I want to be love. And to explain this, I'd like to share a story. In August of 2010, just before my junior year, I was planning to run away from home. I was going to go to New York City and I had everything planned out. I knew what excuse I would use to go downtown. I knew what time to catch which cat bus and on which date to go to catch the cheapest mega bus to New York. I had some money saved up, I had plans, I knew what I was doing. One day I took a pencil and a notebook and I went to a cemetery. I leaned against a tree under the sun and just relaxed as I looked around at the tombstones. Then I began to write the letters I would leave on my parents' pillows just before I would set off for my new life. I got through maybe four or five lines before tears started gliding down my cheeks and it wasn't long before I was heaving and sobbing. I don't know if I've ever cried harder. I never in my wildest dreams would have expected that writing those letters would evoke such an emo emotional response in me. Despite all the reasons I wanted to run away to New York, I was absolutely torn up by the idea of leaving my family. I had never noticed how much I loved my parents until that day. This is the love that I want to be. In the face of challenging circumstances, my love for my family could not be satisfied. All of my physical, mental, and emotional desires wanted to go, to leave my nameless college town life and begin fresh somewhere else. But the love in me would not let go. It's a love powerful enough to override all other desires. It's a love so natural that you can't stop it. That is the love that I want to be, not only for my family, but for everyone I encounter. So, graduates, my inspiration has come from my family, from my friends, my mentors, my experiences, my education, my prayers. These are the things I've come to value and to aspire towards. Be humble, be faithful, and be love. But I encourage you to search your lives and your relationships for the things that inspire you. Because this valedictorian speech, that's not what's going to carry you. 
but you deserve inspiration and you need it. It seems almost silly to me that what earned me the honor to speak today was my grades. Because my GPA is such a small part of the life that has been breathed into me the past four years. School is what I did, but it is not what I was. So as you go out into the world, remember that in your most meaningful existence, you will not only do, but you will be.